2017, Merrill was with Cuso International, Canada's version of Peace Corps, a uh, six-month posting in Georgetown. Diana, um, updating uh, strategic planning with a local non-government organization. Recognized an, an unmet need, she directed a placement position that focused on ecological and economic development for two remote indigenous villages and returned as a Cuso volunteer for another uh, six month hosting in 2018. Her presentation today focuses on the second posting and her time in the indigenous territories of Wakapoa and Akawini in region two of Guyana, which I'm sure she'll point out to us. And recently she, recently she had, has told us that she has a book that is being published uh, from those experiences. So uh, let's welcome um, uh, Meryl Kendrick and uh, her uh, presentation on uh, on the birds of, of uh, Diana. Welcome. You want to, Meryl, are you on? Yeah, Merle, you need to unmute yourself because I can't unmute you. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Thank you. Oh, excellent. Thank you for that uh, for that introduction, Horst. It was much better that you handled it. Uh, you could just cut to the chase. I would end up going on for too long. Anyway, um, yes, I'm I'm pleased to be invited to speak with you today on my time in Guyana, in particular. Um, and as Horst indicated, I have a, a long background in international development. I started doing this work uh, just as soon as I graduated from Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan. That was in, uh, in, in the late 1960s, and I was posted to the U.S. Virgin Islands. I'm a dual citizen. I'm both Canadian and American, which is why I've been able to operate in um, programs for both countries. Then it was the late 70s that I volunteered in Jamaica with CUSA, which is the Canadian equivalent of Peace Corps. And I was there for a couple of years, went on to the Bahamas, did similar work. And at that time uh, in the Virgin Islands, Jamaica, um, and the Bahamas, I was working in the field of education, literacy training, and, um, and uh, aspects of education. Uh, then I, I met an old friend in 1986, and my life changed. That was Skip Kindred. We'd known each other some years prior, had bumped into each other at one point when I was in Michigan, and um, well, uh, I ended up, uh, that's how I acquired the name Kindred. <laughs> and we had a, he was an architect, we had an architectural practice down in the Detroit area, but really got tired of the place, the pace, um, and it was, um, we owe a lot to President Bill Clinton. In 1997, he offered um, the Department of Energy grants for each of the 50 states to do, to encourage energy efficient building. And so um, Skip designed a house. It now sits at 1016 Crestwood Drive. That was the award winning house. And we moved the, ratcheted down our whole architectural practice. I was the business partner. He did the architecture. Um, and we moved to, uh, uh, to Hancock in 1998. And he was there until 2000, until his sudden death. The buildings you'll know that Skip did, Little Brothers, Friends of the Elderly, he helped uh, with the retrofitting of that old building uh, to its current use. And he also designed a number of Habitat for Humanity houses, which uh, won awards with the International Association. And those are scattered around the um, Copper Country now. Anyway, um, the, way, the reason I ended up in, as Horst said, I did a, a doctoral degree 
at Michigan Tech. And um, the reason that I ended up in India was in 2004. Um, I'd finished my coursework, I'd done teaching at Tech and so on. Um, and I had an opportunity to just, uh, just go on holiday to India for a couple of weeks, and I did. And I had my dissertation um, uh, program. I had it uh, submitted to my committee, but when I was in India, there was a huge epiphany. I was sitting there in Goa, um, drinking Kingfisher beer, looking out over the Arabian Sea, and I suddenly realized I needed to talk about energy efficient design and construction from not only a Western, but an Eastern perspective. So I uh, hot-footed it back to MTU, told my committee chair to tear up the prospectus and that I was going to do it. Uh, I was going to include an Eastern perspective. And I was asked, how are you going to do that? I said, I don't know, but I'll make it happen. And it did happen. I ended up finding out about the state of Kerala in India and also um, the Center of Science and Technology for Rural Development. And the reason I'm going on in extending Horst's introduction is all of this played into my being in Guyana. I was in and out of India for 10 or 12 years doing consultancy on communications, business practices in the field of architecture um, and helping the organization, this NGO, get um, further known in India and internationally. But then I think I gave as much as I could they took as much as they could, and I decided that the cycle was complete. And that was in June of um, 2016. Well, the feet got itchy again, and by, <laughs> by late summer, I thought I'd take a look at CUSO International and see what was going on. And that's when I discovered this six-month posting in Guyana, and I thought, hmm, never been to South America. I know that Guyana is a birding hotspot in the world and I'd started birding in India and also have birded in British Columbia. So I signed up and um, as Horst said, I was there in, based in Georgetown for about um, four, six months and then had another bright idea. So let's move into the slideshow now that I've given you enough um, extended chatter on my background, and we'll talk about birds and other things. So Janine, do you want to get us started? I'm getting it queued up. Okay, it takes a, so we're, having, Janine has kindly um, agreed to run the slides for me and I will just talk. Okay, how are we doing? Yeah, that's good. Okay, and if you have, um, if you have people's faces on the right-hand side of your screen, you can just go up to the top right, press that little horizontal bar, and it'll reduce it to just, now you can see the bird. All right, so um, off to Guyana, in, um, back to Guyana again in 2018. What happened at the very end of my posting in September of 2017, um, it had been a rough posting. Guyana is known as a dangerous place. There's an undercurrent of violence in the country. It's, um, and, and I experienced that when I was there. But at the very end, I went to a part of Guyana I had not been birding in up on the northwest coast and got a picture of this bird in the deep interior. Um, I let the Guyana's Birding Association uh, mount this picture, the crimson hooded mannequin, or known as firebird locally, and this, uh, they got like 500 hits on this picture the first day it was posted. It was that famous. Next. Go ahead, Janine. We can go to the next slide. There we go. Okay. There's a, uh, Janine said about a four second delay. So we'll develop a rhythm for keeping these going. 
this is where Guyana exists, uh, up on the northeast coast of South America. Um, people initially asked me how was uh, my time in Africa, or how was Africa, and I'd say, well, it was probably fine, but actually I was in South America, you know, Ghana and Guyana. This used to be British Guyana. It's wedged between Venezuela and Suriname, which used to be Dutch Guyana. It has a population of about 780,000 people. There's still a lot of people exiting Guyana, and the birth rate and the exit rate are about the same. So it's about a standard, about three quarters of a million people in the country. It maintains 80% of its rainforest. It's considered one of the 36 uh, biodiversity hotspots on the planet. It has over 900 species of birds. Half of them are endemic. They're there all the time. About a quarter migrate in from the north and about another quarter migrate in from the southern part of the southern tip of South America. The population is the largest percentage are Indo-Guyanese who were brought in as indentured laborers in the middle of the 19th century and have stayed on. Uh, the next largest group are the Afro-Guyanese and they were brought in as slaves starting in the 17th century when the age of exploration began. Guyana was um, discovered, quote unquote, by the British under the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. So it, the history goes way back to the beginning of the age of exploration, the age of exploitation. Uh, the rest of the population is made up there are some Portuguese, some Chinese. The indigenous population of nine tribes constitutes probably about, uh, I've seen various figures, anywhere between seven to 10% of the population are still indigenous. And where I went for the second year was that orange spot over on the right of your screen. That's region two, with a population of about 50,000 people. Now I had flown into region, um, eight, region nine to do birding, region eight and nine. I had flown in in 2017. It was extremely expensive to fly that hour uh, into the interior to go birding. Um, and I was there as a volunteer. So I was on you know, just a stipend and, and so on. So that was more than I could uh, handle. But I was able to, let's go to the next slide, Janine. I was able to get to um, region two in about four and a half hours. First, I'd leave Georgetown. I'd cross the Demerara River on a river taxi, didn't cost very much. Then about an, um, an hour on a public taxi to Parika and then cross one of the major, the estuary of one of the major rivers in South America, the Essequibo. It would take about three quarters of an hour, and it could be, it could be a pretty wild ride, depending on whether it was stormy weather or the tide was coming in or whatever. Then we'd get over to the far shore, to Good Hope, uh, to Supanam, and another hour on public taxi up to Charity, and then on to a, um, a water taxi again for about uh, three quarters of an hour north to the northeast. And then to the right, where I ended up um, using, as, uh, what I ended up using as a home base was a Dells Rainforest Eco Lodge in the upper right there. It was just off the Pomeroon River where the Akawini Creek ran into the Pomeroon. And this is the, um, this is the Pomeroon River. That's it. And the two territories that I was able to access was the Wakapo Amerindian Territory and to the south of it, the Akawini Amerindian Territory. That's how they're labeled on the map. Actually, um, they prefer to be called indigenous people as opposed to Amerindian. Uh, those were, and again, we would get there by boat. 
Next. And here's the Pomeroon. It's a great, beautiful uh, river. And we traditionally traveled in these homemade wooden boats. Next. And this is the Dells Rainforest um, Resort. It was just off the Pomeroon and it was on about 60 acres. This area of the Northwest coast is uh, swampland. It's an extended river estuary. So there's a lot of building up the banks of creeks and rivers and building um, houses uh, up on stilts, on pillars, so they don't get soggy. And this was a farm area. It was actually a, um, a Frenchman who escaped uh, the uh, French Revolution in the late 18th century, who came to Guyana in, and established himself along the Pomeroon. This was a small parcel of land, um, a small, basically a fruit farm. Uh, coconuts, lemons, limes, pineapples, and so on. And uh, it was established, uh, the three farm buildings were put together with boardwalks and it made this just lovely little resort with four rooms. The woman on the right is Jessica Hatfield. She's a, a well-known um, person in the field of marketing in the UK. She gave that up about 10 years ago and, and uh, moved to Guyana. She basically had enough of um, marketeering. And she, had, uh, she was volunteering as a uh, manager and promoting Adele's resort. She also commissioned this little shade house out of local wood, a plastic cover, raised beds, and this is where all the vegetables and herbs for the resort were planted. Next. And Adele's became my home base uh, between villages. Now, fast forward, I was there just for a brief weekend when I met the crimson hooded mannequin, saw the other birds from the uh, region and thought, what if we could develop ecological and economic development for these indigenous uh, villages. And I went back to Georgetown, talked to my CUSO program manager, and uh, we agreed that I would write a project proposal for CUSO International. And I did, and they accepted the proposal. And I was sent uh, <laughs> Naturally, I applied for the position. And so I was back in Canada for three months. And in January of 2018, I returned to Guyana for second six month posting. Jessica was there at Adele's. We had the Adele's boat. Ian was now a partner with Jessica. He was Afro Guyanese. Um, he has background in mechanical engineering. He's also a composer and a musician, and he's also a master chef, a man of many talents. And he was, he had been gone from by a Guyana since he was 10 years old, but he decided to come back. He was part of the diaspora who had returned. And what we're doing is going deep in the interior because we've heard from an indigenous logger and hunter that there are harpy eagles, which are the second largest eagles in the world. They have a wingspan of over two meters. And uh, the only larger eagle is the Philippines eagle. We were going to check out some of these websites because this could become a basis for birding in this area and ecotourism. So off we are uh, going on a five-day expedition. Next, we're heading down Akawini Creek to their major village. We stop at their stelling, which is a Dutch word for wharf. The Dutch controlled this area until the early 19th century, and then the British won out, and the Dutch moved over to Suriname. You can see the old stelling, the old wharf. 
It's about a quarter of a mile long between the embankment. It's going over swampland to get to Akawini Creek. And we were there to pick up um, two young men. They were the eldest sons, 18 and 19 years old, Elijah and Jacob. They were the eldest sons of the Tushal, who was uh, Akawini's village uh, leader. And they, he, they were going to help carry um, some of our gear and help set up our camps. They had seen a large nest. They were loggers. They had seen a large nest about three hours up in the high country north of their vill or south of their village. So we hiked up there the first day. You can see the nest at the very top of that tree. They helped us set up camp. Next. And the eagle landed. There it was. This pale bird with a small crest, dark feathers. I saw it, that's uh, in, in sunlight. Uh, the sun was just setting when it landed. We also saw what I figure was the same bird the next morning as we were breaking camp. Uh, we, I, uh, we were, it was at high elevation with its back to us. So I had to um, focus up into the branches. And at one point my arm started to shake. So I had uh, Ian who was close to me. I said, stand behind me hold my upper arm so I can keep shooting. I got a series of pictures of this bird or birds, but it took me two months to get a positive identification because I had no experienced birders with me. I had local people, but they didn't know the book names of the birds. They knew local names, either in English or in Arawak, but, they couldn't, um, but I, I didn't know enough about South American birds to know what I was seeing. Next. This is what the book showed me the bird looked like. The harpy eagle, the female is darker and considerably larger than the male. The male would be, uh, well actually the juvenile is the one on the uh, lower right. I didn't have a picture of a male. I didn't know if I was seeing the harpy eagle juvenile or was I seeing a male I didn't have a picture for. So, didn't know. Next. But we continued on up into Akawini Creek, which got narrower and narrower. And we are in wetlands, as you can see. Whoops, let's go back, Janine. Can we get back or maybe not? Is that the... There, there we go. That's the one I want. As you can see, the creek is getting narrower and shallower. We also had to carry a chainsaw because quite often um, these creek banks can rise by many, many meters during uh, the rainy season when the Amazon is flooding down uh, to the Atlantic. And so quite often trees fall across the creeks and we had to chainsaw our way through. Uh, we had two smaller boats this time. One had a small motor and then we pulled, pushed, or uh, paddled the other boat. So there were seven of us on the expedition. And we're looking for nests. We didn't find any of the others, but we kept going up the creek. I also shared my birding book on the lower right with the indigenous fellows. And they would look at birds and give me uh, local names, which was interesting. And they were also learning what the official book names are. Next. Mm, got a bit of a sluggish system here. Yeah. Sorry about that. 
anyway, this is this is the crew, and um, we've uh, people ask why was I wearing a life preserver in the middle of the rainforest, and I said any time that that's okay, you can let it go. Um, any time that we were on water, CUSO dictated that uh, we had to be in a life preserver, so I used one of these personal flotation devices, like a horse collar. I also carried uh, my camera equipment, binoculars, um, a cell phone, and uh, the QSO satellite phone. But for a satellite phone, you have to be able to rotate 360 degrees, and we were never out of the rainforest for that to happen. So basically, we were on our own uh, with just using our skills. Next. As a side point, Ian also found out he was related to those two young men. His great-grandfather had also been in Region 2, and uh, there was a shared last name. So he, he actually, um, they were distant cousins of his. At one point, the going was getting very rough. We were already uh, three days into the trek, uh, hadn't seen more nests or eagles, but we knew we were in eagle country. Um, there had been other sightings of, of the birds. And so at one point, I, t um, I told Chris and uh, Elijah, let's go up a, a distance and let's see what the river looks like. Well, it was getting worse, and we were also getting tired. We'd been, done, been doing a lot of hard labor to, um, to carry forward. So we went back to camp and I suggested uh, that we return, that we turn around because it's when, when, when you have accidents is when people are, are exhausted. So we did in fact make the return trip starting later the next day. Next. <laughs> We also encountered shallow, uh, in these shallow waters, electric eels. So there were times when we all leaped into the boats. Anyway, um, this is now where the river, the Akawini Creek is widening. We are going through um, still swampland and in the far, in the distance are the rainforest. The swamplands were always ringed by rainforest. And this is, um, this is subsistence living. These folks are out fishing for the night's meal. They don't have refrigeration, so they would be fishing on a daily basis. Next. And I did promise you birds. I gather there are some folks from the Audubon Society who have tuned in today. Um, P.S. Those of you in the who are, are um, birders, I do have um, other presentations on birds of the interior, but this is sort of a mixed presentation. Anyway, this is back at Adele's, the black crested ant shrike with a bit of nesting material in its bill and the blue-gray tanager, which is called blue sake um, in, by the locals. Uh, usually these birds were in pairs. They had a beautiful chirping sound. They'd be chatting back and forth, and they ranged from this very pale blue up near the beak with a bright, dark black eye, all the way down to different shades of blue and a bit of uh, black at the end of the wingtips. Quite lovely bird. Next. And here is the silver beak tanager. They would call it a wessel in Arawak. The beak doesn't look quite silvery. It did before I took the picture. But anyway, another perky bird with a lovely kind of reddish, burnished red feathering. Next.
And just across from our stilling at uh, Akawini Creek, um, I looked up and there was a three-toed sloth in the tree across the creek. And these animals are just amazing with an incredible <laughs> baby face on them. And I actually encountered a three-toed sloth the year before when I was in central Guyana brooding. We were uh, boating on the Essequibo and I caught something that was sort of pinkish gray out of the corner of my eye. I thought it was maybe just a, a dead fish that was belly up. Turned out my um, Makusi guide, my Makushi guide said no, had the boat turn and it turned out to be a, a sloth swimming across the river. They do on occasion swim. So we gave it a ride. We just had it hold on to the uh, edge of our aluminum boat, took it across to the other, um, the other shore. And um, that was, uh, that was quite amazing. Next. Here's the interior of Adele's, and there were other guests from Canada here. He was Guyanese, she was, uh, she was from Jamaica, and we were having lunch with Ian doing the cooking and using a lot of fresh fish from the ocean. Uh, we'd get them from Fisherman Jack in the town of Charity, and then uh, using the vegetables and herbs from the garden. Next. This is the Scarlet Ibis. If we did have guests such as this couple, we'd quite often take Adele's boat We'd go up the Pomeroon to the mudflats on the Atlantic at uh, sunset, and we would see these ibis. They would uh, munch on the crustaceans on the mudflats, and that gave them their brilliant uh, red look. Next. And yes, there are alligators or caiman in Guyana. I only saw one once when I was in uh, Region 5. Sorry, Region 2. I was in Region 2. Gave you the wrong number there. Hmm, you're having to look at this critter for a long time. Did you ask me to, I didn't hear you, sorry. Oh, you didn't hear me. Oh, sorry yeah. about that. Okay. Um, and sometimes my pictures were fuzzy, uh, but I like the uh, red and white on the left. Scarlet ibis for sure, a heron or egret. I'm thinking probably heron, but I'm not sure. Fuzzy. Um, the lesser yellow-headed or greater yellow-headed vulture. I was never quite sure. The next picture I was sure though, because I got to see it topside. Next. Mm And it had actually quite a bit of yellow and red on its head. It isn't terribly visible in this picture, but I could tell by the, uh, uh, the uh, angle of the wings that this was a lesser yellow-headed vulture. Next.
And this was a crimson crusted woodpecker that I saw in the uh, back, back in the farm at Adele's. Also went tromping through the underbrush and saw the crested oron pendula, or they called it a bunya. And it had brilliant yellow beak and tail and then a bit of red um, under its wings. Next. And got the confirmed um, naming of this bird when I, two months after we were upriver on Akawini Creek, I met Wally Prince, who's one of Guyana's leading birders. We had coffee in Georgetown. He looked through all my photographs and he said, I've seen a lot of harpy eagles, he said. I've never seen the bird you photographed. This is a crested eagle. So another rare bird. And I got uh, an even closer uh, definition of what I was seeing a couple of weeks later when the head of Guyana's uh, largest tour organization, Wilderness Explorers, came with two other birders to Adele's and went up to see the nest that, uh, that we had seen and looked through my pictures and he told me not only had I seen a crested eagle, he said what you've seen is a juvenile crested eagle, when, which meant that there had to be a, um, a pair, there had to be parents somewhere in the area also. So that was very exciting news. And again, this, uh, this, this news uh, floated through the birding community of the country. Next. And this would be the crested eagle. And what I saw was the juvenile in the lower right hand corner. Next. And quite often we would take, uh, I traveled the rivers a lot. I really enjoyed being in the rainforest. It was a profoundly peaceful experience. And quite often when I was leaving Wakapo, we'd end up taking the shortcut um, through to the Pomeroon. And this was always great fun too. These trees that could live both in dry conditions and wet conditions. Next. And there's Matthias, who uh, brought me back to Adele's one day using the shortcut. And I stayed with he and his family. I'd hang my hammock there when I was in Wakapo. Those are his youngest children. I got them to uh, beading, and I also started embroidering, working with young people at the, um, on School Island in Wakapo, also gathering women and youth that was part of my mandate from CUSO, um, was to be involved in gender equality and social inclusion. So it was a way to start communicating with people and, um, and finding out what their talents were also. This little boy on the right, it's amazing. They have no roads, they have no vehicles uh, in, the, in these territories, and yet he embroidered the outline of a car. <laughs> Next. And yes, I slept in a hammock with a mosquito net uh, over top. That was my, uh, that was in the family's uh, living space. Wakapo had done a community garden that they wanted me to visit. Each year the government would give the various um, indigenous territories a sum of money to do with as they saw fit. This last year, 
Wakapo decided to do a community garden of 12 acres, but it was about by going by the creeks and overland, it took over half an hour to get to it. There was no um, strong water source. They'd done slash and burn, and now they had run out of money. They had planted, but they didn't have money to pay villagers to go back in. I wasn't, I couldn't say a whole lot that was positive about this project, but I did have a piece of good news for Wakapo. Um, the gal on the right, I had met when in my first posting, uh, on my first posting in 2017, I'd been in a vegetarian uh, restaurant in Georgetown and I was just finishing up my lunch and this young woman came in. I didn't recognize her accent. So when she sat down, uh, it was atypical of me, but I asked her, cause she didn't sound Guyanese. I asked her uh, what her accent was. She said, oh, I'm just visiting. I'm from a place called Vancouver in Canada. <laughs> and I said, I'm from Penticton. She said, oh, please have a seat. Well, it turned out she was in her early 30s. She was well experienced in organic um, agriculture. And she was visiting Guyana for the first time with her father and her aunt and uncle. They were visiting family. And um, so as we talked a bit, I, um, I asked her if she'd like to meet my program manager. And I told her what work I was doing in... Um, in Guyana, and I told her about QSO. So she did. The next day we met with Vanessa, my program manager, and um, Lydia was very much interested in coming back and possibly being an agriculture uh, advisor in organic um, agriculture and soil restoration. And this is what happened. The following year, I helped write the placement description we had some other agricultural specialists uh, with us uh, in CUSO. They also helped write it. And uh, Lydia came the next year and worked in, in Wakapo. So that was a good thing. Next. Next. There we go. Now, on to Akawini. Here's the two lads that were um, our guides and helped with the boats and the camps when we were on the Harpy Eagle Nest Quest. Vanessa is my program manager and she needed to come up. We needed to talk with the two shell, the lad's father, to talk about what work I, they, he and the village, village council wanted me to do in Akawini. So I handed over my uh, laptop and told the lads to show the two shall their um, the Harpy Eagle Nest quest. What he wanted was strengthening of their youth wildlife group for the purposes of uh, developing ecotourism. And there are some of the uh, youngsters in the group. And also got permission to do uh, handcraft training. It, in, this, uh, in this case, we're doing beading to start discussions with young people and get connected uh, with village, villagers. Next. And when I was in Canada, those three months between the two assignments, I also presented on birds to the South Okanagan Naturalist Club, of, of which I'm a member, and um, asked for donations of equipment I could take back to Guyana. So I got several pairs of binoculars, which I brought and uh, left in Akawini. So we'd be out, we'd be out at dusk, we'd be out early in the morning uh, birding. And the, I also um, shared my birding book. And in fact, the two shall asked if I could order a copy of that book. It's Robin Restall's The Birds of Northern South America. And we ordered a, um, a copy for the Youth Wildlife Group. 
Next. Vanessa and I work together to have a couple of programs established for Akawini. One was to have the Environmental Protection Agency of Guyana come in and do a two-day training with youth on how to do ecotourism and how to preserve their habitat, how to keep it clean, how to, um, to make this a destination that visitors would like to visit. And as you can see, Jacob on the right was also part of this, um, of this program. And the trainer was Salik. She was Indo-Guyanese uh, and Muslim. And she was, uh, did part of the training. Also with another fellow who was uh, Afro-Guyanese, another young man. They were the trainers that we brought in from Georgetown. Next. There's me in my Akawini uh, hammock. And I stayed with the, um, the, head, uh, the assistant, uh, the headmaster of uh, Akawini and his family. The Tushaw and the village council had also decided to build a guest house for ecotourism. The house was built uh, over the wetlands at the end of their stelling, their wharf. I looked at it. Um, it was already well underway by the time I got there. It kind of looked like a 1960s house in North America. Uh, it didn't make sense in terms of design and sighting, but I didn't say anything. Uh, I wasn't asked to participate in that. So, um, yeah. And this is another part of uh, Akawini. I think those, I think I'm seeing a cashew tree with its blossoms dropped. I think it's cashew. Also, there's uh, some of the young girls in Akawini. Um, with a um, indigenous headdress. Those are found feathers. They wouldn't have killed the birds for them. I did ask about that. And that would be an indigenous headdress, a chief's headdress. This is how people get around in uh, using the creeks and rivers. And there's a white winged swallow, which I would see near the creeks, a perky little bird. Next. Here's the tropical mockingbird. They're found in all 10 regions of Guyana. The wattle jacana, or spur wing as they call it. Beautiful coloring and enormous feet as it walks on lily pads in wetlands areas. And also a kiskadee. There again, whether it was the great or the lesser, I never knew. Um, but I knew it was a Kiskadee at least. Next. The second training session that uh, Vanessa and I uh, worked out with the Tushau was that we would fly for young people. We'd get them out of uh, Region 2, get them to Georgetown, and fly them into the North Rupununi, where I had been uh, birding the year before. They were going to uh, visit Sarama Eco Lodge, which was the first of the indigenous eco lodges that had been established about 15 years prior. It would be a chance for the young people to hear from the people who were actually operating the, um, the facility. We would also be at Rockview Lodge, which was uh, privately owned. Um, it was developed 
by a fellow who was a, a VSO volunteer. Uh, that would be a, a UK volunteer, volunteer service overseas. He was about my age. He had arrived in Guyana about the time that I had arrived in the US Virgin Islands, and he had stayed and developed ecotourism. The, um, and also the Bina Hill Youth Institute was a training institute for indigenous youth, and it trained them in about 10 different areas. Tourism was one of those areas. By the way, I do know about capital and small letters. When I sent this, um, when I sent this PowerPoint over to Janine for posting, it somehow changed my uh, writing. So I do know about capital letters, but it changed them all to mixed letters. I have to say that because I'm a uh, I have an, uh, a degree in English language and literature, so it's embarrassing to have this <laughs> showing this way. Next. Oh, and the, these are savannas. This is dry savanna. Uh, it will flood during the rainy season, but then it goes back to being dry savanna. Whereas in region two, where these young people were from, it was always soggy savanna, a uh, soggy uh, swampland. And there are the four youngsters. Jacob was there, the eldest of the two Shao's sons. Uh, Candace was there. Um, she's on the right. She was Waru. That was her tribal origin. Um, and to, to the back is Daisy. She's Carib. And then Tabita and Jacob are Arawak of Arawak uh, heritage. And you can see some of the petroglyphs, some of the writing, the glyphs from the Makushi people of this area. The structure that's here is sort of a benob on steroids. This is how they build in, in the um, dry savanna areas with wood and bamboo and then a thatched roof. This one is extremely large and it was the office building for uh, Surama Eco Lodge. And here's the Savannah Hawk. Next. We had two days with the uh, Surama people and they were absolutely marvelous in uh, presenting all aspects of what's involved in ecotourism. And at the end of the second day, um, the youth group uh, from Sarama came and danced. Those are hand crocheted costumes, and the, there's hand painting of the uh, Savannah Hawk on the front drape that the young men are using. And these young people sang and danced and told stories and showed crafts of the Makushi people which was really impressive to the uh, young people from region two. And then when we were at the Bina Hill Institute being given a tour, we were also invited into their radio station and the North Rupununi broadcasts from Bina Hill. And so we were invited to speak about our, um, our experiences. And Jacob really amazed me with what he said. He said he was very impressed with the fact that the Makushi had been able to keep so much in the way of their customs, their costumes, uh, their food, their language, their dance traditions. He said, we've lost so much of ours in my territory. He said, I'm really impressed with how much you've been able to retain. And this rather quiet, young indigenous man then said on radio, he said, I like your way of life so much here, I might even come back and find myself a Makushi bride. <laughs> At which point the, uh, the instructor who was the interviewer said, did you hear that folks? I've got a Tushau's handsome young man who may be looking for a wife in Makushi country. So I thought that was quite amazing. Next. And here's Tabita. 
oh, how I enjoyed this young woman. She was an absolute dynamo and was really working hard to um, develop birding skills and develop the, um, the Akawini youth group. And also very, um, very astute young woman. She said, we didn't call it a club. She said she thought club was too closed a group. We just want to call it a group. And I thought that was uh, an interesting turn of language. I also found out why she was the dynamo that she was. When, she, when it was her turn to record on the radio, uh, she said, I'm Tabitha Campbell. My great-grandfather was Stephen Campbell. At which point the interviewer nearly fell off his stool a second time. He said, ladies and gentlemen, we have the great-granddaughter of Stephen Campbell who was the first indigenous member of parliament in Guyana in 1957. So obviously, uh, Tabita's dynamism uh, <laughs> is genetically endowed. And the embroidery that I saw in the Rupununi was fabulous. Very, very detailed tapestries of indigenous life. Fantastically uh, detailed. Next. Just before I left, Iwok Rama, which was a protected area in the North Rupununi, uh, published the guide to the birds of Iwok Rama. I was delighted to see that. And also Molly, one of the um, women in Wakapo, did this gorgeous embroidery of a blue and yellow macaw. Next. And because Guyana does have 900, more than 900 species of birds, um, illegal bird trading is also a big industry. Guyana also has gold, has diamonds, has bauxite, does a lot of illegal drug training, uh, trading from Colombia, and uh, birds are also at risk. In this case, it was uh, tiny finches being stuffed into hair curlers. And of course, many of those birds would never make the uh, trip. And I'm sure even if they did, they'd be severely traumatized. Very sad. Next. And finally, <clears throat> a group of scarlet ibis in uh, Guyana's National Park in Georgetown. Such gorgeous birds. We had large flocks of them also in the area. Cuso did ask us to blog and I am now resuscitating my blog. Um, but if you are interested in seeing more of the wildlife or also the city life, I didn't give you much in the way of uh, the architecture or the urban life of Guyana. You can check uh, mekindred.wordpress.com. And I am now updating that on a monthly basis. The, what's happened with CUSO is uh, it had been, it started the same time that Peace Corps did in the early 1960s, but as of June, um, of 2019, CUSO exited Guyana. It had been there for over 55 years. Um, the funding oversight committee uh, in Canada basically uh, took CUSO out of five countries. I couldn't find out which five they were. Um, I suspect three of them were in, in South America. Also, um, since then, elections, uh, Guyana had its uh, national elections in early March, and those elections have been in dispute. 
It's the Afro-Guyanese and the Indo-Guyanese fighting for power. There's a lot of political uh, dueling, even though the country has been independent since 1966, it's still not made the kind of progress um, that could be hoped for, considering the uh, fabulous resources it has at the, um, and those elections are still in dispute. COVID-19 has also arrived in Guyana, and I have not gotten details on how extensively uh, it's impacted the country, but they certainly don't have the sophisticated uh, medical means to deal with uh, massive COVID-19. Uh, for the past 18 months, I've been focusing on um, thinking about Guyana. I've been doing this kind of work now on and off for 50 years, and the question always has been, what, uh, what, what's it like? What's it like to do international development? So I have been working on a book. It's called, uh, in the working title is Insights on Guyana. I now have it in the hands of a professional editor uh, in Vancouver, and I will get it back with, uh, with a response by the end of the month. And I am looking to publish this book. Um, we shall see. Publishing is basically flatlining in the world right now. All the things that companies have to do to get books out into the world uh, are at a standstill. So publishing is another of the industries that's really experiencing um, great trauma right now. So who knows how I'm going to manage in getting this, um, this book published. But anyway, that is uh, the essence of my presentation. Uh